Because of you, Beta. I'm glad you came along. And you, Varl. We couldn't have done any of this without you. Right back at you, Aloy. The bypass is done. The core is stable. Festus is 100% contained. Now we better get started with the merge. It's all set up. Gaia, 
Establish the link, please. Done. Okay. To complete the merge, we need to excise Hephaestus' malicious code. Carefully. Cost us quite a lot of time. <laughs> Eric, get beta. And squash that bug while you're at it. Zelda, get Gaia and Hephaestus ready for transport. Zelda! I failed. Hush. All is not lost. Zelda! What the hell are you doing? Stop her! Where am I? Ah, you're awake. You took quite a hit when Gerard attacked you. I imagine you must still be in a great deal of pain. I can assure you that we are safe. The others can't detect us here. You mean the other Zeniths? You must be Tilda. I wasn't sure if... Beta would have told you about me. Where is she? Alive. And while she isn't where she wants to be, not in urgent danger. We must discuss how to get her back, of course, after you've shaken off the cobwebs. When you're ready, take the stairs down the hall and, and come see me. 
In the meantime, I'll make breakfast. Breakfast? Okay. Till to bring me here. What is this? Just a few favorites from my collection. Rescued and stored here just before I went off world. Take a look if you like. I'm curious to hear your impressions. My friend is dead. Beta and Gaia are gone, and you want me to look at old paintings? Don't be so quick to dismiss the comfort we can find or the insight we might gain. My favorite pairing. On the left is Woman Reading a Letter by Vermeer, a true master. And on the right is a forgery, Woman Reading Music, which fooled experts into believing it was a priceless original. Early in my career, I became fascinated with such deceptions. Eventually, I developed scanning software that could detect fakes with unparalleled accuracy. Is that how you made enough money to buy your way onto the Odyssey? Oh no. I made my real fortune later. Why do you keep the forgery? I've always enjoyed studying the two side by side. Both painters capture light, color, and perspective. But what makes one a masterpiece and the other simply an imitation? The forgery looks... Sharper? Good eye. The details are crisp. The contrast bold. It tells us more. And yet, we feel less. What's in the letter? Who can say? What does the painting tell you? She's... concerned? Whatever's written in the letter troubles her? A burden. She can't put down. Fascinating. Why go through so much effort to make a fake masterpiece? The forger initially painted under his own name, but found little success. His work was considered unremarkable. But when he took on the guise of Vermeer, suddenly it was celebrated as extraordinary. But it was a lie. And he knew it. Sometimes we struggle to glean what is real and imagined, even within ourselves. The irony of these two is that Vermeer died in obscurity. He had no idea his work would become some of the most precious, most copied, most preserved pieces in all history. Sneaking up on him? More like visiting him in secret. The torch that Cupid bears represents Selene's undying infatuation with him. Though the two must remain apart, her love will forever burn. And why can't Selene and Endymion be together? 
Selene took a vow of chastity, promising to her. So when she fell in love with Endymion, she could only visit him at night while he slept. But then wouldn't she be breaking that vow? Think of it as a forbidden love. Though circumstance keeps them apart, still they find a way to come together, however briefly. Aren't Selene and Endymion cold? Perhaps we should move on to another piece. Shall we move on? This is Rembrandt painting Jeremiah, a man in mourning. Mourning what? His home. The ancient city of Jerusalem. He foresaw its impending doom, but could do nothing to prevent it. So instead, he saved its treasures from destruction, just as I saved these works. You could say we're kindred spirits. About Jeremiah. If he knew his home would be destroyed, why didn't he save the people? Why save those relics? He tried, but no one would listen to his warning, so he saved what he could. But how did he know? He was a prophet. He saw an army invade and destroy the city in a vision. So it's more like he calculated which side would win a battle. What matters is that he was right in the end. If not for him, all those wonders would have been lost forever. At least this way, some part of his world survived. You know what I like the most about this piece? Even though he's the sole survivor, his home in ruins, left with only the remnants of his world. The light keeps the shadows at bay. There's still hope. Precisely. Take as long as you like. of the painter Rembrandt's son Titus depicted in the habit of a monk I don't get it why would someone like you with infinite resources care about this painting of a boy in a hood it's not the image itself but the feeling it conveys the face is bright and defined but his eyes are downcast heavy with misfortune and the background seems to swallow all light. The painting is infused with a sense of loss. I guess I understand how the painter feels. Works of art such as these can often cause us to look inwards at our own lives. I'm sorry about your friend. Had I been able to intervene, I would have. But the risk of losing you as well was too great. Everything went by in a blur. I couldn't get to him. You know, long before holograms and focus recordings, people relied on art to memorialize their loved ones. Because of works like this painting, their lives are immortalized. Rembrandt had four children by his wife. All but Titus died shortly after she gave birth to them. She passed not long after that. Titus became the only family Rembrandt had. Which is why he painted him this way. Indeed. Then tragedy struck again. Disease claimed Titus at 26. It's almost as if Rembrandt painted the future, closing in on him. Rembrandt actually painted several portraits of Titus, but this one has always been my favorite. It's honest. What do you mean? In others, Titus was portrayed in brighter, livelier states, but here, Rembrandt allows himself to express his true feelings. Sorrow, fear, hope, love. 
laid bare on campus for all time. I see this one resonates deeply with you. Rembrandt's The Night Watch, by far the most famous painting my homeland ever produced. It was commissioned to honor a militia made up of influential citizens. I guess you must have been an influential citizen. In my day. But not as influential as you've been in this new world. The militia. They look disorganized. Where others painted such scenes in a stiff and stationary manner, Rembrandt chose to show them in action, preparing to march. He wanted them to feel alive. You can almost hear the commotion. Who's the girl in the painting? She's a strange one, isn't she? Bathed in light, though no one is paying attention to her. Many believe she's a symbol of the militia. A physical manifestation of their spirit, if you will. But she's not real? What's real in a painting? She's meant to represent the militia's virtue and victory. But I like to think they underestimate her. She looks as if she's seen something. What does she know? What secrets does she keep? There's so much detail to take in, isn't there? A ship crossing into the unknown. I guess you're familiar with that. Indeed, which is why I appreciate this composition in particular. Though waves and wind threaten to destroy the ship, it perseveres, clinging to the light even as darkness closes in all around it. Where is the ship going? To a faraway land, most likely. My ancestors used ships like these to explore the world, sometimes at great cost. What were they looking for? Anything of value. They were traders willing to face unknown dangers to make their fortunes. But no matter how far they went, they always turned their sails home. So this... Von de Velda only painted ships? It was his specialty. Following in the footsteps of his father, Willem the Elder. The two had quite a journey of their own, taking them all the way to the court of a foreign kingdom. Did they ever come home? No, but eventually their lives worked it. Take your time. Stunning, isn't it? Paintings weren't the only masterpieces of my people's golden age. This is Van Vianen's lidded ewer, molded from a single sheet of silver. What was it for? How like Elizabeth you are. <laughs> Function over form. Its practical purpose was less important than its meaning. Van Vianen created it in honor of his late brother who himself was a famous silversmith. A memorial? Yes. Such beauty from sorrow. If this you are was a memorial, how did you end up with it? As the pharaoh swarm closed in, my homeland's greatest museum gave it to me, along with many other works, in the hope that I could preserve them. A masterpiece like this was too important to lose to history. I even considered bringing it with me off-world to ensure its safety. Why didn't you? I took a calculated risk. This vault seemed more secure than the unknowns of space. Besides, I thought someday I might return. A long life after all has its advantages. Now, lo and behold, here I am. Exquisite, isn't it? She's pulling out her own 
here. Out of madness, out of grief. It's hard to watch her suffer. I should move on. A lot of weight on his shoulders. I know the feeling. I should move on. There you are. Feeling better? How did you find us at the cauldron? And what did you do to everyone right before I passed out? All business. Well, suffice it to say we were keeping a very close eye on Hephaestus, knowing we would need it at some point. Your ruse didn't fool us, and as for my little trick, it was an overload of the senses accompanied by an energy discharge. Gerard and Eric were only momentarily disoriented due to their shields, but it, it rendered you unconscious while I got you out. Perhaps some breakfast might steady you a bit? This was your house. The one you recreated for Beta, in the data channel you shared. How perceptive of you. Please, this way. After everything your people have done, you think I'm just gonna sit down and have a chat with you? They're not my people. They never were, and especially not now. You shot off into space with them and live with them for a thousand years before coming back. So what made you suddenly turn on them? Quite simply, this. My old focus. You repaired it? But that means you've seen incredible things. What you've accomplished in two decades of life thousand years at my back and I haven't even come close. I'm sorry if I invaded your privacy, but I had to. In order to understand. To be enlightened. You truly are Elizabeth's blood. With her drive, her sense of mission, her integrity. Watching all this shamed me for the company that I've kept. Having seen it, all I want is to help you. Even if it means stopping your friends? Especially so. Please, sit down. There. That's better. Now. We must recover Beta and Gaia at all costs. By now, you must know that Gerard intends to use Gaia to reboot the Earth's biosphere. Remaking this world to specifications that would only suit us immortals. This process will kill every living thing on the planet. He calls it a clean install. Not if I stop him first. Not if we do. And once he and the others are gone, we can work together to fulfill Elizabeth's dream. I'm sure Beta told you that there's a build of the Apollo database on board our ship, a complete collection of human knowledge. With that and Gaia, 
We could do everything Elizabeth wanted. Heal the biosphere, educate the people of this world, uplift them. Create the world she imagined. <clears throat> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. From what I've seen, your friends are invincible. I do wish you would stop calling them my friends. And they're not invincible. In fact, a friend of yours has found a way to defeat them. Silence. Oh, he's been a busy bee, building an army powerful enough to crash through Gerard's precious base. Regala and her rebels. Even now she's preparing a final march on the Tanakh the capital. When she wins, she'll have the entire tribe under her control. Hundreds of warriors and machines to throw at the base. She's been duped. They'll all perish, of course. But it should be enough to break Gerard's defenses and allow Silence to kill him. Along with all the others. Using the new weapon he's developed. Yes, he's found a way to circumvent our shields. Truly an exceptional man. He's planned for everything. Except you and me. You see, while his army is battering down Gerard's doors, you and I will sneak in through a back way, one that only I know about, while Silence and my friends are busy battling each other. We'll take back Beta and Gaia. I told you I want to help you. I mean it. My old focus. How did you find it, let alone repair it? When we encountered you at the Hades Proving Lab, Gerard saw you as a redundancy. I knew better. You were a revelation. After your dramatic escape, bravo, by the way. Gerard and Eric assumed you were dead and gave up the hunt. I wasn't so sure. When the others were busy, I returned to the lab and searched for any trace of you. That's when I found this little treasure. Not easy to repair, but certainly worth the effort. As I watched your life unfold, you were like a splash of color on a worn canvas. What Liz was, and more. Did you show it to the others? Of course not. It was your actions that inspired me to defy them. It's worth noting that if I hadn't found it and watched its contents, I weave you at the cauldron. You'd be dead. So I should be grateful? If you like. So you know all about me. What about you? What would you like to know? Well, start with your life on Earth. When I was eight, Terrorists flooded my home city. Thousands drowned, my parents included. I was one of the few who survived. My guardian sent me to boarding school. Among my peers, I was the strange girl, the orphan to be avoided. All because of circumstances beyond my control. Oh. So we're a lot alike, huh? Aren't we? You were an outcast, but you didn't let that stop you from getting what you needed. Neither did I. I climbed my way out of desolation and used my wits to build a fortune. First from the technical analysis of art and the detection of forgeries, profitable expertise in those days. But as it turned out, the software I developed was even more useful for counterintelligence. From there, it was only a short step to gathering extremely valuable intelligence on my own. You were a spy? More like a service one could turn to for information. I had to remain anonymous, of course, to protect my privacy. But despite that anonymity, Far Zenith inevitably sought me out. What happened when Farzineth approached you? They painted an irresistible vision of humanity's future. One where 
We need not fear illness or death, where we explored the furthest reaches of the stars and thrived. It was only later that I realized that they only intended to bequeath this future to the rich and powerful. By the time I finally figured it out, the walls were closing in, Faro's machines were devouring the Earth. So I accepted Farzenith's invitation to a birth on the Odyssey. I wanted Liz to come, but she had nobler plans, as you well know. So you didn't know the other Zeniths were monsters until it was too late? I, I knew some of them were, certainly. It, it wasn't until we were off planet that I understood the true scope of their greed. I was grateful to simply be alive, but the others became obsessed with a kind of effortless immortality. They built a colony where machines serviced their every need, where any memory or fantasy could be endlessly savored in virtual reality. It wasn't life. It was stultifying, a pampered dream state. As the decades passed, I withdrew more and more, alone yet again, but this time with eons to consider my mistakes. Now, finally, having met you, I feel like I have a second chance. To do what? Help you to fulfill Liz's dream, which isn't so different from Farzenith's original vision. A better future for humanity. You said Beta is not in urgent danger, so what are the Zeniths doing to her? Putting her to work. Merging Hephaestus with Gaia. A difficult, time-consuming task, as I'm sure you know. They will compel her if need be, but her life is not in danger. She's the only one who can do it. Because you people made her to be nothing but a tool. Gerard's idea, not mine. They always viewed me with suspicion when I attempted any form of kindness towards her. That's why I created the data channel, a virtual place where we could speak in peace. So this channel you shared with Beta, none of the other Zeniths ever found out about it. Gerard believes he's the most cunning of all of us. Even after a thousand years, he still can't imagine that I would outwit him. The channel allowed me to interact with Beta away from their mistrustful eyes. It offered us a chance to be ourselves. Until you cut off all contact. Yes, though it pained me. I was worried that our meetings would do her more harm than good. Well, she felt like you tossed her aside. I was afraid the others would find out and punish her. She may not have had the comforts of friendship anymore, but at least I ensured she was safe. I know it seems harsh, but you must believe that her well-being has always been paramount to me. Why did you make the data channel look like this place? I built this house as a shelter to weather any storm, a safe place. Not just for me, but for the art stored below. Cultural artifacts of incalculable value. Truly some of the greatest achievements of human civilization. And you wanted Beta to see them? Yes. Her upbringing was so cold and technical. I thought if she could experience Vermeer and Rembrandt, it would bring something else into her life. A heritage every bit as valuable as the scientific and technical data being drummed into her. I'm sorry I had to cut off contact, but I'll never regret sharing this house with her. She needed its shelter even more than I did. Beta told me your colony was destroyed. That you came back to Earth because you had nowhere else to go. It's true. After we reached our destination, a planet in the Sirius star system, we spent decades building a new home. The physical constraints of Earth, the boundaries of mortality, gone. To think of what we could have done with it. It might have been a utopia, 
Instead, we stagnated, absorbed in effortless comforts and virtual realities. It took a cataclysm to finally yank us out of our stupor. What happened? A massive geological event. We knew of instabilities in the planet core, but we underestimated them. By the time the collapse was upon us, it was too late to stop it. Only a few of us made it to the ship in time. We set course for Earth, the only safe harbor left to us. Which you decided to make unsafe for anyone else. Not me. Gerard. He believes it's better to wipe the canvas clean than work around the smudges. No more primitive tribes, no more combat machines, only a blank slate to do with as he pleases. But we will stop him. All we have to do is get into that base. What exactly is your plan to sneak into the Zenith base? We will make use of a lesson I learned from an early age. Always know your exits. In this case, a place where Gerard's new construction meets the ancient foundation, a passage that only I can access. When Silence flings his army at the base, we will enter through this back door, bypassing most of the fighting. The distraction will provide us with a window in which to rescue Beta and Gaia. Once we're inside the base, where will we find Beta and Gaia? Here, in the command center. By then, Gaia will have been reunited with all of its subordinate functions, including Hephaestus. What about the Alpha build of Apollo on your ship? A simple matter of recovery, once the others have been dealt with. With that in hand, we'll have everything we need to make this world as it should be. How do you know about Silence's plan? He isn't the only one adept at spyware. You hacked his focus? No, he's too careful for that. But his subordinates? <laughs> Not so much. He gave additional focuses to the tribals he branded the Sons of Prometheus. The ones working with Regala. By tapping their focuses, I learned about most of his dealings. The distribution of override technology, the arming of Tanakh rebels, and the secret pact with Regala to attack Gerard's base. But how did he come up with a weapon that can take down your shields? That's the one thing I haven't been able to figure out, but however he did it, I'm quite certain it will work. With it and the Tanakh army, victory seems to be within his grasp. Such a shame he'll be disappointed. Regala's only interested in killing Hakaro and waging war on the Karja. What does she have to gain by attacking Zenith? It's the price she must pay for her war. Without the ability to override machines, her little rebellion would have languished in the desert. So she trades with the Sons of Prometheus. Machines to help her overthrow Hikaru. In exchange for an assault on the base. Pride has deluded her into thinking she can actually survive such a battle. And all without ever knowing who the Sons of Prometheus really answer to. Yet, for all of Silence's brilliance, still he underestimates you. That blind spot is what will allow us to take Beta and Gaia right out from under him. While hundreds of Tanakh are cut down outside. So you knew Elizabeth. What was she like? Liz was everything she was. I see in you, and more. Your ingenuity, your determination, your moral compass. You've managed to distill her greatest qualities and make them your own. I'm not asking about me. Tell me about Elizabeth. What was she really like? The honest answer is that I don't actually know. For all the time that I spent with her, she always kept a part of herself locked away. It was like that from the moment we met. So when you met Elizabeth, she was what? Distant? Aloof? Not aloof. 
Not exactly. It was a summit in Paris about machine learning, a touchy subject in those days, because regulatory authorities were just starting to clamp down on AIs. Liz gave the keynote address. She had already achieved great renown for her work in automated environmental reclamation. But in her address, she was just starting to imagine the next step, an AI-driven system that wouldn't just act on its programming, but actually take responsibility for its sphere of influence. To care about life, not just follow orders. Revolutionary stuff. I was fascinated. And I wanted to meet her for a long time. I watched her after her talk. She had spoken with such moral authority, such empathy. But after that, she retreated. I could tell she felt uncomfortable with all of her admirers. It was as if giving the talk had cost her something. I didn't want to be a pest, so I planned my approach carefully. So how did you finally approach Elizabeth after her talk? I picked the right moment. The morning of the next day, right as she came back to the conference, she had just had her coffee. She was fresh, rested. It was like she had braced herself for the onslaught of colleagues. I asked if I could walk with her, then put forth a question about her talk that I thought was intelligent. Her answer made me realize it wasn't, but she was very welcoming, almost as if we were previously acquainted. It was only halfway through the conversation that I realized she knew exactly who I was. It was quite a shock to me. My business was trafficking in secrets, and I took great pains to protect my anonymity. So that was Liz, perpetually one step ahead. I came to view our meeting as a metaphor for our friendship. She always seemed to know me far better than I knew her. I guess I know the feeling. First for all. Now Hikaru and the Tanakh. Your plan would wipe out an entire tribe. There has to be another way. We are in an admittedly desperate situation, but I assure you there isn't. Remember Zero Dawn. Elizabeth's sacrifice. Sometimes many have to die for a new world to grow. If it looks impossible, look deeper. Wait. The data channel. It still exists, doesn't it? I need you to open it. Let me talk to Beta. Impossible. We might be detected. It's worth the risk. There is another way, one where the Tanakh survive. But we won't. If the others... If you want to help, open it. What are they doing to her? Virtual reality dissociation. The manual merge of Hephaestus will take hours upon hours of tedious micromanagement. If she resists the work, they run simulations to induce feelings of isolation and despair. Beta, can you hear me? You're alive. 
They're watching me. I, I, I can't hold up this extra projection for long. You should have killed me. No. No, look at me. I'm coming for you. I promise. Okay? I just need you to hold out a little while longer and work on the merch. Again, when it's time. Can you hold on? As long as I know you're coming for me, I can endure anything. All right. I did as you asked. Now I think you need to tell me what you're planning. I'm going to take Silent's army away. I don't need it. Only the weapon he made to penetrate your shields. And how do you propose to get it? Ask him nicely? With Aragala and her rebels, he won't have a choice. We'll be his only option. Only option for what? What did you tell her? That is between me and my sister. We'll be Silent's only option for crashing that base. I'll tell you the rest later. But first, there are a couple of things I have to do. Oh. And what are those? Lay my friend to rest. And then I'm going to use the override that Beta gave me at Gemini to put an end to Regala's rebellion. From the air. Wait. Since you insist on doing things your way, I know of something that will truly help you make a grand entrance with the Tanakh team. The ancient Horus Titans still possess electromagnetic energy cells as part of their arsenal. Drop one of those on Regala's army and they'll receive quite a surprise. So go, do what you must. I'll come to your base if you manage to bring silence to the table. Not if, when. Aaron, are you there? Aloy! Aloy, is that really you? Yeah, it's, it's me. Where's everyone else? We're all... At, we're, we're back at base. What happened? It... It might be easier to explain in person. I'll try to join you there when I can. Okay. I, we'll wait here for you. It's good to hear your voice, Aloy.